Okay. Do you want to say anything? No. Ah, cita suka sam sam. Mr. Jackman. My job is done. It is a very happy day, but come on, that's your turn. Okay, I'm going to say something. Okay, get ready. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk about um, in terms of, you know, the, the place where I spend a lot of time and know a little bit about is um, those aspects of the self that keep you from being able to move into that selfless place. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I've noticed, I'm just going to make a couple of general statements and then see what you think about them, okay? Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that, um, in, well, let me just explain, in shamanism there's this concept of power loss as a root cause for imbalance. And this is called power loss. Power loss. And in shamanism, it's described um, as a kind of energy drain that's happening in the individual who's suffering a particular symptom. And there are particular symptoms <clears throat> that are related to power loss that are corrected with power retrieval. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go too far into that because I want to go over to the Siddha side of it, which is um, from a... Buddhist point of view, that state of power loss, which is um, described again as an energy drain or energy kind of leaking out of the person, that state of power loss with, within the Siddha concepts <clears throat> would or could be described as a disconnection from one's own Buddha nature. And that disconnection occurs through our reactivity to uh, being vulnerable, usually that's, the, that's that first mm -hmm. thing that you were talking about, that reaction uh, to um, you know, being harmed or something like that. And, as, and then that being the thing that consolidates the self and makes it hard for the self to be able to move into the next stages of the meditation that you were describing, right? So in shamanism, this is called being in a state of power loss. And in Buddhism, this would be called being, a, one could say, it's a, a function of the disconnection from one's Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Does this, this yeah, make sure, sense to you so sure. far? So then all of the strategies that we go into to try to accommodate that sense of power loss are the stuff of karmic patterns because we're trying to avoid that pain again or we're trying to be attached to something that we think is going to avoid that that is going to keep us from going into that vulnerability again or we develop misconceptions about oh this is what i have to do in order not to go into that vulnerability again and so you have people who have these different strategies for accommodating their power loss that <clears throat> keep them on the surface of experience with other people where you have energetic exchanges, where you have people fighting over the available life energy, which is low when you have a lot of people who are in a state of power loss, and almost everyone is in a state of power loss. And then what happens is that you have all of these karmic connections and interactions that get established with energy exchanges that are unsatisfactory for everyone, which then augments the what now in psychology would be called ego structures that are designed to try to keep the person out of power loss. And that, I think this is a, a pretty good description of one aspect of the psychological environment that we're dealing with when we're trying to um, help restore health. And one of the big problems that we have in Western medicine, for instance, is there is no concept of energy. There is no concept of this subtle uh, experience of what, you know, in some systems are called chi or prana, lung, 
And um, mm -hmm. so they don't have any kind of remedy for it. They don't have any way to address it. And what we try to do in depth hypnosis, which is the model that, a uh, counseling model that I developed, which combines shamanic and Buddhist understanding about the nature of suffering, mm -hmm. is we try to use the therapeutic environment as a way to first gather power that is universal power that leads the person back into connection essentially with their Buddha nature. And so you start, you start the, the second session that you have in depth hypnosis is that power retrieval after we do the emotional biography. Now, what happens, and those of you that are in the shamans and siddhas class, you saw this happen in class where there was, uh, when we were doing the shamanic journey and making the connection with the universal source of power in the form of a helping spirit, there were some people that had difficulty connecting with that source of power because their karmic patterns that they normally run were brought forward as they were trying their usual strategies to gain power and they weren't working so they could not connect with universal power. When, that make that, when those configurations make themselves evident, and they do through the, we, we set up processes to make sure they do happen um, in, in depth hypnosis, when you get those configurations coming up, then you can work on helping the person dismantle their attachments, their aversions, and their misconceptions so that they can access their Buddha nature, so that they can come out of that sense of power loss so they can be integrated enough to even participate in this kind of meditation that you described. Because if you have not healed the self to a certain level, you cannot do this kind of meditation without going crazy. You have to have a certain level of integration and you have to have a process that um, disrupts the usual non-successful but ever, that holds hope everlasting for the people that are doing it that they are going to be successful in, in trying to gain power. So you have to break up those conceptualizations, those attachments, those aversions, and the patterns that they create, and connect the person with their Buddha nature so that they can rest in it, so they can let go of their selfishness, so they can let go of their ego constructs, and so that they can allow themselves to even look around and see what's beyond the, the self-consolidation that their pain and suffering is creating for them. So I think, you know, this, this meditation that you provided is, I mean, I just, I, I am so grateful for that. That was like, I, I feel like I really understood something about the, as they say in French, the au-delà, that I hadn't understood before. It was so helpful. But I, I think that I, I just wanted to bring this idea of uh, the importance of also working at the level that we work at in depth hypnosis, which is a much more basic level, actually, sure, um, yeah. the, to help people get um, into a place where they can actually do that meditation. And again, the nice thing about depth hypnosis is that it is the combination of the catalytic processes of shamanic practice and working with the map, the wonderful map that Buddhism provides mm -hmm. as a uh, source of suffering. So I just, I just wanted to kind of put that out there and, and see what kind of comments you might have or thoughts you might have about that. Either me, one. Me. You, you, <laughs> my job one done too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, I think that's, of course, you're quite right. Uh, I thought to share that other thing because I feel, you see, the, if you, in Tibet, you first, in the Lambrim sort of thing, you first have developed detachment, and renunci what they call renunciation, where you withdraw from various greed-driven things. Then you have to develop compassion, where you withdraw from various hatred-driven things. And then you, then you, by that time, and then, of course, there has to be an ethical set of, set of ethical changes, where you calm your life, pattern down by being less turbulent with others, which you will become when you are less greedy and less angry. And uh, uh, so that, of course, goes without saying, that you can't really succeed in the more difficult selflessness thing until that is the case. On the other hand, 
And so if you go to a Tibetan teacher or a, Buddhist, or a Buddhist teacher, they will not immediately teach selflessness. And even in Buddhist history, like the, the farmer, the, 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 the donor of the monastery, etc., he would not be taught selflessness. It, it, because that would be considered confusing and like, who am I and why they wouldn't get into that a, at all. Um, and, and there's a famous, there's an idea that emptiness even taught to the wrong person could lead them into a problem. But in our modern period, there is one difference about that. One reason I don't shrink from sharing these things. And even though, as I said, it was a rehearsal. You know, you, it takes a long time to really do it, those four keys. But because I think it's really important, it's something that Tibetan Buddhist teaching brought in, which had never been available through Zen or through uh, any Theravada traditions or Pure Land, which is the idea that the no-self thing in Buddhism is not rejecting the relative self. Psychiatrists, for example, and psychologists and Western people were very scared of both Hinduism and Buddhism because of all this talk that you heard in the 60s and 50s and 70s about throw away your ego. You know, no, let's not have an ego. Oh, yeah, the main thing is egolessness. Let's not, no self, yeah. They thought, oh my, we're going to have a bunch of basket cases because of that. But the point is, the Tibetans were much more careful about it. You know, what you're doing is freeing yourself from the delusion of the absoluteness of your ego. You, you, you need a strong ego to do that. And, and you cultivate that strong ego through cultivating compassion, through cultivating self-restraint, certainly, if we were doing a longer pattern, you know. Okay? But, and then, as far as the emptiness goes, the danger of sharing emptiness with the unsuitable vessel had to do with the fact that the unsuitable vessel was considered to be the person simplistically who just had faith in something. And they were fitting into their niche in society and doing their job. And they were, you know, not, they were spiritualistic in a religious way. And if they introduced to this kind of emptiness, they might lose, they might doubt that and lose that. You follow? But modern people are a bunch of materialist nihilists already. They've already been bitten by the serpent of nihilism, which makes them formally psychotic, actually. <laughs> and, and members of a formally psychotic culture that is not connected to the planet it's on. And that's why it's destroying the planet. And thinks that everything will be solved just by dying. And it has it's become so bad that we are destroying the planet. There's no doubt of it. And so, so in a way, the emptiness becomes an antidote to the nihilism rather than a danger of leading to the nihilism, if you follow me. Of course, there are those nihilists, and they, some, they call themselves secular Buddhists, and they go around saying, yeah, Buddhism is just like science, and we all don't exist. That's what Buddha said. And of course, they're misleading people, and they're confused themselves. And there always will be misunderstanding of everything. You know? But that emptiness equals relativity, and that relativity equals that everything you do will have infinite consequence, and particularly the beginning, and 100% beginning of the Buddhist path. And I would say, in most well-developed, most other than the most backward or the most primitive uh, tribal societies, let's call it indigenous or oral societies, uh, the idea that the human being's spirit has continuity after death and probably before birth is a common sense thing of all humanity forever. And this unique idea that we can just get out of here by shooting ourselves or shooting somebody else is unique you know, to a modern period. And they're shouting and screaming how religions have caused trouble. And they always seem to forget about Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, who were not religious. <laughs> but they were nihilists of different kinds. You know. So, so uh, relativity is something that, you know, when you say connect, again, when you say connect to Buddha nature, then how does one define Buddha nature? Actually, the highest definition of Buddha nature is freedom, emptiness itself. And it means that each being has the nature to find their inner Buddhahood. It isn't like you have a little Buddha in the homunculus inside the soul or something, you know. It's that, it's that because of emptiness, which means freedom, Everyone is a work of art. Everyone is a work of 
of evolutionary construction. And if they become conscious of that, they can design their evolution to lead to Buddhahood as the culmination of evolution, right? And the highest form of possible being. And actually, that's another book I'm going to write. Oh, you yeah. like I'm going to I'm going to borrow from you, and I'll give attribution of the Ah Ah Chitta Sukha Samsa Ah Ah Sukha Samsa, because the title of that book is going to be Buddhas Have More Fun. <laughs> so I, I do like that. That's it. But the, but the, of course, the, the psychology thing in the Western psychology of course, is dealing with people who are crippled by this backward culture that we have. You know, the nuclear family due to industrialization, you know, the, the over-focus on the parents rather than a bunch of aunts and uncles and cousins, etc., in the older, more healthy societies. And, uh, and, the, and the basic idea of this sort of, uh, that there's no point and purpose to it all, and it's just all go out and get, make some money and whatever, you know. And uh, people are damaged by that, and therefore there's a lot of subnormal people. And so psychology is sort of focused on them, but unfortunately, it focuses on them, because, and the idea of healing is to bring them into being effective, effective aggressors in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aggressive society. And that's not really helping them so much, you know. So the, the mixture thing is kind of complicated, in the sense that the thing about power retrieval is good, but the key there, I would say, by both traditions, at least both Buddhist psychological traditions and shamanic traditions, I don't know, the Western one will be different. So it's good to have a mediating connection with the Western. I'm not against it. I'm just saying that the key to the shamanic one is also the exceptional person, not everybody in the society. And the way that they really retrieve power is by giving up all power. And the way the Buddhists do, the, the emptiness thing is by completely letting go and of everything, and then realizing that the universe is, is the power. And, it, and you get buoyed up, you know, it's like the dark night of the soul, those few Christian yogis who were allowed to survive in the monasteries, like John of the Cross, you know, dark night of the soul, and then you completely give up, and then, and then you're buoyed by the loving power of the, of the divine, you know, and which was, that's a brilliant Buddha nature retrieval, even though they have a different Christian language for it. So there, it's a tricky thing that some people in, in this culture, in other words, could appropriate this power retrieval thing as, again, another unsuccessful self-defense thing because of the language of power. And because if you go down to the depth in the shamanic thing, shamanic thing, which again was the virtuoso in those societies who was the shaman, they were called, they had those calling experiences where they would go crazy, actually. So actually they would have to go crazy to then find out that even going crazy, reality will bring them back to life, you know? And then animals will come and bring them, and the trees and the plants, and then they're there to heal the society. So, so one has to be careful, I think, about with that, that's all. I totally agree, yeah. And I, you know, you wouldn't do those kinds of processes without the proper container and set and setting, right? right? I think so. Well, um, I think we have to go, actually, it's yeah. six o'clock. Um, do you want to take a question, Bob? You want to take one sure, more question? Sure, if anybody has one. I, I just have oh, a oh. short word about uh, uh, your speech. What's that? I want to say something. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> great. My job is not done. <laughs> so I think you talked about power, and the professor talked about uh, wisdom. So in Tibetan Buddhism, we have three main Buddhas. The Buddha of Wisdom, Manjushri, yes. and Buddha of Power, Vajrapani. And then there's another Buddha, is Buddha of Compassion and Chandrasi. That's right. So I think, uh, I often think why they are called the three main Buddhas. So this is the three opportunity for different type of people. Some people are very smart, very sharp and very intelligent and university analyzing like professor. And those people, I think they're very good for, you know, going through this Jetsongkhapa's uh, uh, path. And then another uh, group, they are maybe not that smart or they're not ready for <laughs> this uh, path, but they are more talking about power. So that's like Vajrapani group. You know, Vajrapani is like the power Buddha. And so I think that makes sense, you know. First, you don't have power, so you try to 
get the power or regain the power, and then, of course, later the power joined with wisdom. Then the third group is a group of uh, love and compassion. So they meditate on love and compassion from ordinary love to unconditioned love or universal compassion, and then to bodhicitta. And then once you have that bodhicitta, you have a power too. Then you join with wisdom. So I think that's why, like Tibetan medicine says, the best medicine, the best medicine is the correct medicine. So that's why uh, we cannot say everyone has to be a very smart or scholar, or also we cannot say everyone has to be a shaman to get the power. So there are many different groups of people, and the best is they find their own way. But at the end, I think they are all joined together. Yeah. So three groups, the love group, power group, and wisdom group. <laughs> I don't know, we have, there are three representatives. I just, I just say love and compassion. <laughs> Now we're going to go have a candlelight puja Isa, and dinner. Isa, can I ask you just a quick question? Can oh, you yeah. give an example of a universal connection? Uh, did I say it right? The universal connection that you're saying that when people have uh, become powerless, we give them a, you know, I think you said universal connection, or is that too long? What's ago? an example of helping a person who's in a state of power loss connect with universal power? Universal. Is that the yeah. question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, the way that you would do that in shamanic practice is you would have a person journey uh, with the, and alter their state of consciousness, uh, usually through uh, some kind of repetitive sound, so that they can deepen their perceptual capacities to be able to perceive something larger or more subtle than their usual uh, suffering, right? And the, the, it, the intentionality there, when you're helping someone walk that path, is to, to say within the journey that you are going to connect, and in depth hypnosis we actually adapt the journey into something a little bit more mainstream and we say that you're going to connect with a part of the self that has only your highest good as its sole intent and we do this in a hypnotherapeutic process so they're going internally they're doing an adapted journey on a quest for power and if they don't have to think about it being outside of themselves or the fact that there's feathers or drums or anything like that they only have to consider the possibility that there is a part of themselves that does have their best and highest good as its sole intent and which is wise. And then they connect with that through an image that is meaningful to them. A light, a sound, a mythic, an archetypal being, an animal, a plant, or a person. And then that part of the self then becomes the anchor uh, that, or the safe harbor that they return to again and again as they're doing the work of repairing and dissolving the karmic patterns that are keeping them from being able to hold that power and rebuilding themselves. That's the part of the self that helps them rebuild themselves into a more coherent uh, sense of self that is not disconnected but connected. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.